Now I'm going to ask you if you have your Bibles to get those out and be turned to Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to pray and then we're going to get right into this morning's message. Uh, this is part three, so the first two parts we covered uh, Revelation chapter 1. And this morning we're going to start Revelation chapter 2. And I'm going to explain to you just where we're at and how this whole uh, format goes through the book. But we definitely, most certainly, always want to seek the Lord first. So would you bow your hearts and your minds before him with me? Dear Lord... We come because Jesus has made the way for us to approach you. We come, dear Lord, with grateful hearts that you have revealed yourself through the Bible, that you have given us this living book so that we could know Jesus Christ our Savior. And that we could know a hope that goes beyond a broken, broken, failing world. God, this morning, you know what you have put on my heart as a preacher of your gospel this morning. And I'm asking you to prepare my heart and to prepare the hearts of every person who is listening that we might be right with you. There is nothing more important in the universe. There's no problem that we have that is bigger than the problem we face when we are not right with Jesus. And so God, I pray that you would help us to be right with you and to find peace in our relationship with you and to find the hope that overcomes the world. God, as so many are struggling in so many ways, as we're learning more and more clearly that this world cannot bring the answers we're looking for, may we be driven to you. Driven to you. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, it's a strange mercy of God that when he allows things to go wrong when he allows things to crumble around us when he allows the world to become chaotic when he allows things to get difficult it is a strange mercy of his that what he's actually doing for the heart that would seek him is driving us to himself which is where we ought to have been all along that's what God is doing right now in the midst of everything that's happening in the world today. Now this morning, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 2 in part 3 of our series. And uh, I'm going to go backwards actually. I'm going to refer back to the end of Revelation chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, Revelation chapter 1 verse 19. And then we're going to go right into chapter 2. Uh, I'm going to read, for continuity's sake, the seven verses that we're going to focus on today. So this is Revelation chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Jesus said these words. He said, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you've not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not... I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, 
which is in the paradise of God. Now those are the words of Jesus Christ to a particular church in the first century AD, the church in Ephesus. And because God's word is timeless, and because Jesus chose to put these words right before the unveiling of the horrors of the tribulation and then the second coming of the Lord, we know that these words are meant for us in the day in which we live before the return of Jesus Christ comes. We're on the precipice of those end times. And so we need to listen carefully to what Jesus is saying to us in his revelation. Now, if we remember going back to chapter 1, verse 19, we left off with Jesus telling the Apostle John, write therefore the things that you have seen, write the things that are, and write those things that are to take place after this. In other words, there's three categories, John, Jesus said, that I want you to record. Now, the things that John had already seen it are the, the, the magnificent unveiling of Jesus and his second coming, which we saw in Revelation chapter 1. A much different looking Jesus than the Jesus in the manger or the Jesus on the cross. So Jesus says, write about that. But then he says, I want you to write about the things that are currently happening. And that is where we find ourselves today in chapter 2. Because Revelation chapters 2 and 3 talk about the status of Christians or the status of the churches during John's day. When John was exiled on that island and getting a vision about everything that's to come in the future, Jesus said, what I want you to do before you reveal the future in chapters 4 through 22, Jesus said, what I want you to do first, John, is I want you to write about the status of the churches. Now, Many of us in studying the book of Revelation, we want to jump right in to the tribulation period. We want to understand that. We want to wrap our minds around that. We want to jump right in to the Antichrist. We want to understand that. We want to jump right into the second coming of the Lord, the battle of Armageddon. And believe me, we're going to get into all that. And it is fun to study. But it is super important that we lay things out as Jesus chose to lay them out. Because my friends... What happens to you during those future events is solely dependent on where you are with Jesus right now. And these two chapters of Revelation are put there first so that Christians can be, number one, encouraged in the things that we are doing right, and that we might be admonished or warned in the things that we are doing wrongly. Because the day of reckoning is right around the corner. So the one thing that you want to know is that you are right with Jesus Christ. I wrote in my notes regarding this, I kind of summarized that thought, and I said, in light of the Jesus that we have witnessed in Revelation chapter 1, the Jesus with the flaming eyes of fire and the feet of bronze, right? This newly revealed Jesus. In light of that Jesus... We need to take a deep and difficult look at ourselves. The examination of our position with Christ, as he is revealed in all of the Bible, including Revelation, is of utmost importance. Our position during future events to be revealed in the book of Revelation depends solely on our standing with Jesus. Believe me, you don't want to be caught during the tribulation period realizing that you have fooled yourself into thinking that you were in right standing with God. And if the Bible is true, which it is, and I've taught this for many, many years, one theme that is in there is it is possible for Satan to blind us or to deceive us. It is possible for us to be deceived. That's why we must stay in the truth. And that is why we are not skipping Revelation chapters 2 and 3 because Jesus said that they are important. That is the status of things as they are now. These were literal churches in John's day, but the status of these churches applies to every Christian and every church throughout history. That's Revelation chapters 2 and 3. As I said, these were seven letters to the churches, 
we call them the churches, but I want you to think of that as Christians, right? Because churches are composed, the true church of Jesus Christ is composed of true believers. These were, as I said, literal churches in John's day, as we discussed in chapter 1. And the letters are relevant for all time, representing conditions to be commended and corrected throughout the age of grace. I want to be abundantly clear about something. Ever since Jesus came and died on the cross, we have been living in the age of grace. The age of grace. We are living in, since Jesus came and died on the cross until this moment today, we are still in the day of grace. The day of God's undeserved favor. You may think the world is a mess, but believe me, this is the day of God's undeserved favor. This is the time where you can call upon him as Savior and be made right with God. And the reason I want to emphasize that we're in the age of grace is the second that the church is raptured out of this world, which could happen at any moment, when Jesus meets Christians in the sky and calls us up to himself and we are raptured off of this world, then the tribulation period begins. The age of grace will be over. The time of God's unmerited favor will be over and it will be the day of judgment and how difficult it would be to find God in that day. You want to respond to him during this age of grace. That is one of the reasons that God has allowed you to tune into this broadcast so that you can know and so that you can share with others. All right. So let's dig in. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to cover the first seven verses today. Uh, Jesus said to John, he said, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And we've already discussed that the angel of the church in Ephesus could mean the pastor, the overseer spiritual overseer of the church in Ephesus. And Jesus says, I want you to write the words of him who holds the seven stars. We're told in Revelation 1.20 that the seven stars represents the seven angels of the churches. And the seven golden lampstands represents the churches themselves. So Jesus is saying, John, I want you to write the words of me. I am the one who holds all spiritual leadership and all spiritual powers, even if this means literal angel, I hold them all in my hands and I walk among the churches. Now, Jesus tells him to write this particular part to the church in Ephesus. And as we had discussed back in chapter 1, these seven churches existed in Asia Minor in the first century A.D. This is what is today modern-day Turkey. And Ephesus is right here. It's the first church in uh, the kind of circular order in, in which they are written about. So here's Ephesus, and it was a seaport. And notice John is writing from the island of Patmos right off of, uh, right off of Asia Minor, which is, again, modern-day Turkey. So there's the church there. Now, I, I've got a picture here up on the screen of some modern-day ruins of Ephesus. Ephesus, in case you didn't realize this, was a very prominent city in John's day. It was a major seaport. It was economically influential, politically influential, and also religiously influential. And again, here are some of the ruins of that mighty city. A little bit of background information about Ephesus in John's day. As for its religious life, the city boasted one of the wonders of the ancient world, a grand temple dedicated to the fertility goddess Artemis, who we also may know as Diana, this goddess of fertility. Besides this, Ephesus had a rigorous emperor cult with several temples dedicated to his worship. So Ephesus was in spiritual trouble 
Uh, they worshipped the goddess Diana, who was the fertility goddess. There was a temple dedicated to her there, which is one of the seven wonders of the world. And also, they worshipped the Roman emperor, had several temples built to the Roman emperor. So this was a mess, spiritually speaking. And you can imagine how it would be to be converted to Christianity in the city of Ephesus and to kind of have to live against that with Jesus as your savior. But we kind of feel that pressure today, don't we? Because the United States of America might have used to have seemed to be a Christian nation, but there is so much uh, spiritual distress and confusion. Crazy. So Jesus said, I want you to write the words of him. Now, I just wanted to emphasize that and underline that for a minute to get you to think, when you're reading the book of Revelation, I want you to understand something very clearly. Every single word has been given by God. Every word of the Bible. The Bible is not just generally inspired by God's Holy Spirit. The Bible is specifically inspired by God's Holy Spirit. One of my favorite verses is Proverbs 30, verse 5. It says, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Every word of God proves true. So we can't ignore any of the words that are written here. And Jesus is very specific. I want you to write these specific words. Jesus then reminds John that he is the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. In other words, Jesus is walking among the Christians. He's in the midst of the churches. Now, Charles Swindoll said something uh, really important regarding that. He said he walks among them. He examines them from every angle. No praiseworthy quality or embarrassing imperfection can escape Jesus' notice. He's aware of their every thought, intention, and motive, caring enough for their well-being that he will both encourage and correct them. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm right in it with you. And not just as a church, but as an individual. Jesus is walking with you. He knows the good and bad about you. And he cares enough, he cares enough to tell us the good and to tell us the bad. Amen? That is what these two chapters are about. So he goes on to say, this is Jesus speaking, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and you found them to be false now this sounds like quite a compliment doesn't it yeah jesus is complimenting a lot about these christians in ephesus again in a town in a, in a city a place where there is a lot of false spirituality and paganism and idolatry happening and jesus says i know your works i'm aware of all the good things that are happening your works notice that boy i'll tell you what if there's one thing that the devil wants us to get wrongfully uh, fixated on is all works that's that's religiosity and we're gonna we're gonna see this in just a minute but works are a result of true faith and so Jesus says, I know you've been doing your works. You've been doing a good job at that. You know what that might have meant for, you know, if we put it in modern day terms, Jesus could have looked at the church of Ephesus and said, hey, you guys are, you got it going on. You're doing the prayer meetings. You got small groups getting together. You're having youth group on a weekly basis. I see you doing community outreaches. I mean, you're, uh, you're trying to, to reach out and do as much as you can for the unbelievers. You're having your elders meetings. Maybe you got some worship concerts going on that you're offering to people. You're involved in the food banks. You're feeding the poor. You're clothing the poor. And these are the kind of things that could have been meant. I know your works as a church, as a Christian. I know you're doing all these things. You're keeping yourself very busy in the work of the Lord. I want you to think about that. Because as I was getting ready to speak today, I thought to myself, the great irony 
of the times in which we live is churches have been stopped from doing some of these things. We've had to really slow things down. And maybe that is one of God's way of getting us to see why are we doing these things? What have they really done? Because done properly and of a right motivation, they should encourage people's walks with the Lord. But I've got to say that during this pandemic, you know, there have been times and occasions where I've heard pastors and people and ministry leaders say, this has been horrible. This has been terrible. And I think to myself, the work of the Lord should never be stopped or affected by a pandemic. I mean, if you were depending on all the busyness of the church to keep you moving forward, then you were wrong in the first place. If worshiping God meant you had to have big crowds of people and fancy lights and, and all kinds of dazzling backgrounds, well, then you were in the wrong place to begin with because that's not what worshiping God is about. And if we were dependent on all of our activities and motions and things that we were doing rather than a real relationship with God, well, then God's trying to shake you up. So I just want to say that works are not wrong. Genuine works follow genuine faith. But Jesus is complimenting them for their works, but he's also saying there's a problem. And I want to tell you, if you are a ministry leader, if you're a person who's influential in your church, I want you to think about this. No pandemic should have ever slid down the true work of God in human hearts. Hallelujah. Can't stop God. And so if, if things have been stopped that we were depending on, then those were the wrong things. The wrong things. Okay? So let me just move on here. So Jesus said, I know your works. He said, I even know your toil. And the word there in the Greek means work combined with difficulty. In other words, they were taking a beating for their work. Now, I like what Charles Swindoll said about this too. He said, not unlike Jewish merchants in Berlin in the 1930s, Christians in Ephesus would have been the objects of physical violence, social ostracism, and economic repression. Yet they endured. They bore up under the light. In other words, they were being persecuted in this prominent city for being Christians. And they were probably suffering uh, economically their businesses and other things because they were Christians. And yet they were bearing up under it. And Jesus commends that. He says, I, I commend you for how you cannot bear with those who are evil. Okay? So what that would have meant was, you know, at Ephesus, in their official church, they would have allowed no unscrupulous business practices. They would have made sure to tramp down on any sexual immorality was happening. Uh, there would be no outward impure conversation, no fits of rage, not a bunch of liars in that church, not a bunch of drunks in that church. You know, outwardly, they weren't tolerating evil. And again, that's not... A bad thing in and of itself, but it depends on the motivation. It depends on the status of the heart. But Jesus says, these are the things that I commend you for. He says, in fact, that they've actually tested those who call themselves preachers or apostles and really aren't. Which is very interesting. Because Jesus, in Matthew 24, 24, speaking in the end time, says that false Christ and false prophets will arise. And perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So Jesus commends them for trying to discern false prophets because Jesus of all people knows that as the end times progress, there will be more and more false preachers and false prophets. And this is a very dangerous thing that they will try to lead people astray. So Jesus commends the church in Ephesus for that. As a matter of fact... The Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, this is so interesting. How, by the way, uh, you know, Ephesus is one of the seven churches that Jesus writes to in the book of Revelation. It's the only of the seven churches that also has another book of the Bible written to them. And that is the book of Ephesians. So Jesus writes to the church of Ephesus in Revelation, but also the book of Ephesians that is written to them. Now, 
In the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul, the context of this chapter is the Apostle Paul actually called together the elders of the church in Ephesus. So you talk about uh, scripture interpreting scripture and cooperation of scriptures. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the elders in the church of Ephesus. And here's what he said. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood, right? The believers are important, Jesus said. I paid for them with my own blood. And so pastors, elders, church leaders, I want you to pay attention to yourselves and to all the people under you. I know that after, look at what Paul says here, to the Ephesian elders, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. So Paul's speaking to the leaders at Ephesus here in Acts and saying, here's what I'm telling you is going to happen. When I leave, there are going to be false prophets wolves in sheep's clothing who are going to come in and they are going to devour people within your congregation. Wow. So this false prophecy thing is very, very important. It's very important today. I'm always warning you of that, to stay in the word of God and measure everything that any pastor or teacher or supposed Christian author writes or speaks of. You weigh it against the word of God because there's false, uh, there's false teaching out there everywhere. Okay, so Jesus says, you guys have done the right thing. You've tested people who call themselves apostles, and they, and they really aren't. And my goodness, you've actually found them to be false. So that even goes a step further. Not only are you detecting false teaching, but you're applying the test of scripture to it, and you're calling these people out as false teachers. Which is interesting. Interesting because this was written in the first century, 90 AD. And there was already a church finding false teachers within it in 90 AD. We're in 2020, on the precipice of 2021 AD. And if the birth pains of the end times work like Jesus said they do, and they do, then that false teaching is just going to continue to snowball you know we're in a dangerous place. So Jesus has all these wonderful things to say about the church. He says, I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. I know that you haven't grown weary. Have you ever been one of those Christians? I've certainly been one of them where you say, oh, I'm, I'm just doing it all. I'm, doing, I'm working as hard as I can for Jesus. So I'm, I'm not growing weary. That must, you know, and it's important. You know, Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. But working and not growing weary is not the essence of Christianity. It's an outflow, but not the essence. And then come these horrifying words. After all those wonderful things, Jesus says, But I have this against you. I just want to pause there. I don't care how many good things, I do care how many good things Jesus has to say about me. But if Jesus looks at me and says, but Shelly, I have this against you. Boy, God help me, I don't want that. Right? So all these wonderful things, but then Jesus says, but I have this against you. Now, first I put in my notes, how important that we want to hear our correction as well as our commendation. Jesus is faithful to tell us all we need to hear. The question is, are we faithful to listen? I have this against you. Here's what he held against them. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. That's a strong word. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. What a statement. 
amidst all of the detection of false prophecy and all of the meetings and outreaches and all the works that the church was doing, Jesus said, you've walked away from, you've left, you've abandoned the love that you had at first. Now, in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, and I'm reading this from the New Living Translation, the Bible says, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. What is the purpose of the commandments of God? And the purpose of the commandments of God are to show us how sinful we are, not to show us how to be good. I mean, and, you know, there was, a, there was a time when many, many people, and I'm not, I don't, I don't want you to email me and tell me you hate me because of this, but there was a time when many, many people were putting the Ten Commandments signs in their yards around where I live. I think in an effort to remind people that we live by God's law. You know, we're supposed to be good and moral people. And in a Bible study one night, I reminded all of my people that the law can never make somebody right with God. You can't stick a Ten Commandments sign in your yard and expect your unsaved friends to start living by the Ten Commandments. All right? First of all, if you read about what Jesus said concerning the Ten Commandments, you know, he went on to say, you know, murder is not just something that happens outwardly. You murder in your heart every time you're angry at somebody. I mean, we can't keep the Ten Commandments. And it's just so important for us to realize that the commandments of God were not given so that people could suddenly be good. We need a Savior. The law was given to show us actually how bad we are. I look into the mirror of the law and I realize I'm a wreck. I need somebody to save me and give me power to do right. So given that the law is there to show us how sinful we are, then the greatest commandment that God ever gave is going to be the one that shows us what our main problem is. Amen? If the law shows us how bad we are, then the greatest commandment will probably reflect mankind's greatest problem. Hence, we look at Matthew 22, 37 and 38, where Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Okay, so if we go to the Old Testament, the first commandment was, Thou shalt have... No other gods before me. You don't put anything else before me. Your love for me, your worship of me has to be first. Jesus comes along and says, the great and first commandment is to love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. So that tells us what our main problem is going to be. We're going to struggle, amen, to love God first and most. That is going to be our struggle. So when Jesus comes to the church at Ephesus, he says, you have all these wonderful things that you're doing, but you've missed the main point. You've abandoned the main thrust of the gospel, and that is to restore relationship between God and man. Hallelujah. Relationship between God and man. So Jesus says, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. John Phillips said it this way, with eyes aflame, the Lord says that one large debit consumed all their credit. How sad is that? They were doing so many things right, but their heart had gotten away from Jesus and was consuming all of their credit. John Phillips, it is possible to serve the Lord for a variety of motives, for the praise of men, for prestige or position, for the sake of reputation, because it is simply the thing to do, because of a sense of duty. But if service for God is not born of a devoted passion for the Lord Jesus, it is worthless. You hear me saying that? Whatever you are doing for the sake of Christianity, if it's not motivated by your love and passion for Jesus, it's absolutely worthless. 
And I know for a fact that there are people in ministry, they're doing it because that is their career. That's what they feel obligated to do. It was passed down to them. It was suggested to them. It was something that kind of interested, interested them. There are people who get up and, and, and act as Christians and do things for the sake of their reputation or to have people say how wonderful they are, right? But God says all of that is worthless. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. Meaning Jesus knows that somewhere back down the line, the church at Ephesus did have a devotion to Jesus. But it got all washed away by all the stuff that they were doing and all their busyness. I have a question for you. And it's a question for me. I put this out on Facebook yesterday and it didn't get very many likes and I didn't expect it to. The question goes something like this. Was there ever a time in your life when you were more in love with Jesus Christ? Was there ever a time in your life when you were more just genuinely excited to know that Jesus had died for your sins and loved you so much and was taking care of you? Was there ever a time in your life when you were more excited to simply sit and tell people about your Savior? If there was ever a time before when that was true, then this applies to you and me. And I want to tell you something. It's true of me. When I was preparing for this message, man, I was remembering back to my teenage years. And God really struck me. You know, when I was, I, I've shared this with you guys before, when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at age 13, I gravely, gravely ill, nearly lost my life and found out I'd face a disease the rest of my life. And I was only 13 years old when that happened. And I remember when I got out of the hospital that week, I came home down to my bedroom and I remember uh, what, what my bedroom looked like. I remember the color of my of my comforter on my bed and I remember kneeling beside my bed and praying and being filled with God's Holy Spirit being called into ministry because of the tragedy that I had just faced and because I realized life was more than just about frivolous things and then I remember as the years went on I would just get my hands on every bit of commentary and study material of the Bible that I could possibly do. I remember I worked a job, <laughs> I tell this story, it's, it, I worked a job when I was a teenager, when my dad was out of work, I worked a job through uh, some state-sponsored program, full-time in the summer, where I had to get down on a little scooter in an elementary school, and I kid you not, my job for most of those days was to take a razor blade and scrape the extra wax off the perimeter of every classroom in that elementary school. You talk about a sad job. I worked with a couple other adult custodians and me. And these custodians were not saved. They used language that you wouldn't believe and it was the most depressing atmosphere. And that was my job. But as I shared with a young friend of mine during that time, I took a tiny piece of paper folded up in my pocket and I began to memorize Bible verses as I scraped the wax off the sides of those classrooms. And many of the verses that you'll hear me quote today were born out of that experience because I was so determined, so in love with Jesus that he had spared my life and called me to his purposes. I was so overwhelmed with his love and forgiveness and grace and I remember being in high school and staying up till 3 in the morning on a, on a night of high school classes, staying up till 3 in the morning praying and singing hymns as a high schooler. And God struck me with that thought as I was preparing this message. And I thought to myself, Shelly, has there ever been a time when you 
love Jesus more. I remember those days of, you know, being just young and, and taking my Bible everywhere I went and my extended family, we'd go out to eat sometimes. Uh, I think it was a Sunday, you know, afternoon, we'd all go out to eat. And I remember having my Bible at the restaurant and I didn't care what anybody thought about me. I was going to carry that Bible. I was going to talk about that. Man, I took my Bible to high school. Listen, that's a love and a passion for Jesus that, that you had at first. But that's the very thing that Jesus is now saying to me and saying to you. If you can go back and remember that excitement, that fervor, and that love, and it's any less than that now, then you need to go back. Amen? I hope I'm getting some amens because I'm putting myself out on the line here. And I'm telling you, it's the truth about me too. So God is using this sermon. May it cause a revival in our hearts. So Jesus said, if that's true, then I want you to remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. And that's what I was doing as I'm just talking about these things to you. I'm remembering, therefore, the place from where I have fallen. And I got to tell you, I have a little um, 11, almost 12-year-old friend now, a protege of mine that you know, many of you. And I had a chance yesterday to look into her eyes across the table and to read and study the Bible with her. And as I look into her eyes, and I think she's so young, I think of that verse where Timothy says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but be an example. And I looked into her, the, her eyes as I began to try to feed her in that passion for Jesus. And I think to myself, God, create that simple passion again in me. Hallelujah. This is what we need to do. So here's what Jesus said. How do you get back? Because that's the question. How do we get back? First of all, you've got to remember. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. I went back in my mind and I remembered going into the hospital and being diagnosed with that disease and, and how that scary that felt, but how Jesus was there for me and how it turned me toward him and I started going back and remembering what did I what did I do then look because he says repent and do the works you did at first what was I doing back then when I was so on fire for Jesus well number one I was walking around and I didn't give a care who said what about me I carried my Bible I talked about Jesus didn't matter if it was my family my friends unknown strangers I, I sat and scraped the wax, you know, in that elementary school, and I practiced those Bible verses, and at lunchtime, I got down my, I got out my Bible verse list. I didn't care what anybody thought. So I thought, i got to go back to where I don't care what people think. You can call me a lunatic if you want. But I'm going to go back, and I'm going to remember what were the works I did at first. Man, I, I got out a hymn book, and I sang hymns to myself. I had my Bible out and I got on my face and I prayed until the wee hours of the night. You got to do the things that you were doing when your passion was at a height. Because listen, there's nothing more important than Jesus. Nothing. Nothing that you have on your schedule, nothing that you have to do that is more important than knowing Jesus. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. Repent. Do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, I'll get to that in just a second, but Matthew Henry said it this way. How much more comfortable they could lay down and sleep at night how much more cheerfully they could awake in the morning, how much better they could bear afflictions, how much easier the thoughts of death were to them, and much stronger their desire and hopes of heaven. And he's talking about when they would go back and remember what it was like when they truly loved Jesus with passion. I remember those days. Man, nothing seemed to bother me back then. I, I looked down the road at the future and I thought, oh, whatever the future brings, Jesus has got me. He'll supply the need. Today, I find myself often shrinking in fear rather than walking in faith. And that's what happens when we're in passionate love with Jesus. We can bear our afflictions so much more easily. 
Death does not scare us. And our hope of heaven becomes brighter. So many people say, Shelley, oh, you give me so much hope about heaven. I love your passion for the end times and for what heaven's going to be like. That was born out of a love for Jesus that happened a long time ago. They need to have that love today. So Jesus says, repent. Do you know what repentance means? It means a genuine inward change of heart that comes from God. You got to change your mind about this thing. Uh, I, I got a note here. You know, technical department is telling me some people are asking, "How do I do it?" That that shows you're you're repenting. That's you're genuinely wanting to change your heart and your mind about this thing. And this will result in changed behavior when you really mean it. Now, it will not be behavior modification, okay? Because you can force yourself in the flesh to do a lot of things, but that's not repentance. It's not fake reformation. Again. The church at Ephesus was doing a lot of right things, but their heart was wrong. This is not a matter of simple human will. Repentance is not, well, I want this, so I'm going to do this. If you're feeling a nudge in your soul right now, and you want to get back, that's because God has given it to you. So it's not your will that's doing this. God has prompted your heart. Now you've got to respond and say, yes, I want to change. I want to go back to that kind of love. And then Jesus says, do the works you did at first. And I already talked about this. You got to go back and you got to think about where you were and what you were doing. What your priorities were. How you were ordering your time and your life when you loved him more than you do now. I want to remind you that in 1 John 4.10, the Bible says, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Now again, Jesus says, do the works you did at first. But I don't want anybody to think that you can muster up love for God. Your love for God is only a response to his love for you. Listen to me. You are not asked to muster up a love for God. Your love for God is only a response to his love for you. When I go back and I think about my passion for Jesus, I remember knowing and feeling just wrapped up in his security and his love for me. I remember thinking, I can't believe you saved me, Jesus. I can't believe you've given me this hope. And out of that love, I wanted to love him back. Amen? So, doing the works that you did at first means responding to his overwhelming love. Knowing that he's got you. Man, he loves you. He's calling out to you today through this message. It's not that you ever loved him. I didn't ever love him first. He loved me. And out of that love, we love him back. And finally, look at this, look at this word of warning. If you don't repent, if you don't go back, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, I got to tell you, as I read different commentators on this, you know, there's a lot of different opinions as to what that means, that he would remove their lampstand. We know that the lampstand represents the churches. And so when he says, I'll remove your lampstand, does he mean I'll just do away with your church? Well, that didn't happen immediately uh, to Ephesus. Does he mean I'm going to remove your influence as a light in the world? I think that probably gets to the heart of what it means. I don't know exactly what was in the mind of Jesus, but I can tell you I do not want this to happen to me. No matter what you want to interpret this as, to have Jesus say if you don't go back and repent, if you don't get this thing right, then I'm going to remove your lampstand from its place. I don't like that. I don't want to know what that means. But at the very least, since it's a lamp stand that represents the church, you would think that that means the light that is coming from that church, that influence will be gone. Done. And if you apply that to a human individual life, whatever you think you're doing as a Christian that's not truly motivated by a passion for Jesus, if it's behavior modification, if it's I'm going to do this because it's what's expected of me, I'm going to do this because I want people to think well of me, whatever it is that's not properly motivated, you're not really a light for the kingdom of God. 
You're a light for yourself. But you're not shining the light of Jesus for anybody. I'm going to explain that in just a second. John Phillips said this. He said, if there's no real love for the Lord Jesus, then the reason for the assembly's existence or the church's existence has vanished. A local church that is functioning without love for the Lord is worse than useless. It gives a wrong impression of what Christianity is all about, and it is at best removed. Now, I'm going to get wound up about this thing because I'm going to tell you a pet peeve that I have. <laughs> I want to say this gently, but I'm not going to. Okay? I see so many churches today that have slogans print out t-shirts, say all kind of stuff about, you got people walking around in the public with shirts that say, I love my church. What? So I'm going to go on to the public, to the unsaved people, and I'm going to be wearing a t-shirt that says, I love Hope and Passion Ministries. What is that telling anybody? I love Hope and Passion Ministries. I love my church. Do you understand that that is once removed from the real love that you ought to have? If you want to witness to somebody, you're not witnessing to somebody. A, a church can save you. I love my church because my church saved me. My church redeemed me. No, I love Jesus. Jesus saved me. Jesus redeemed me. And he used my church as a vehicle. I think we're on very dangerous territory today. Because we're talking about churches and we're talking about Christians who always seem to be one step removed from a genuine love for Jesus Christ. Whatever you do, it should be motivated by a love for Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I think that's what John Phillips was trying to get at. If you're doing good works and it's not motivated by a passion for Jesus, then the people who are looking at your works... They don't know what Christianity is. They're at best going to say, oh, well, Christianity um, Christianity means that you, you have community outreaches. It means that you care about the poor. Well, yes, true Christians do care about the poor, but Christianity is not about community outreach. Christianity is about people are sinners damned to hell without hope. And they need Jesus to come and forgive their sins and make them new so they can have relationship with God. This isn't a social club. Does that make sense to everybody? And so when we don't have a genuine passion for Jesus, when people, my prayer is that when people see Shelley Brindle, they see Jesus. They see a love for Christ and his word and his truth and his salvation. All right. I'm going to try to wind down a little bit here, okay? So Jesus says, if not, I'm going to come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Okay, technical department's telling me all my wildness is worth it. You're, you're giving me the thumbs up. I'm, I, I'm sorry, and, it, and if anybody is offended and will be offended by the future recording, okay. Outward motions... Right doctrines and good works are not it. Passion for Jesus is it. Jesus said, yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And just spending one minute on that. The, the Nicolaitans were a heretical sect uh, known for their idolatry, sexual immorality, and probably combining worship with paganism. It was not a good thing at all. And Jesus said, again, I commend you because you hate the works of the Nicolaitans and I also hate the works of the Nicolaitans, so you're right in that. Notice Jesus said you hate the works of. You don't hate the Nicolaitans. You hate their works. Very important point for Christians today in this angry culture in which we live. We don't hate sinners. We hate sin. Okay, so Jesus again commends them for that. And then finally, the last verse. Here's what Jesus said. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. He who has an ear. Now, I always joke about this, and I say there wasn't some pandemic in the first century where people were getting some type of ear virus and their ears were falling off. 
I mean, what did Jesus mean? If you have an ear, listen. I mean, were there a bunch of people that didn't have ears? No. People had ears. You have ears. How many times have we had physical ears, but we don't have ears in our spirit? So Jesus is saying, okay, you could be hearing these words, but if you really care, if you're listening with your heart, then you should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. And I could go off on a whole tangent, preach a whole sermon on this. I'm so sick of church growth programs and hearing what the latest expert has to say about this is what you should do for ministry and that's what you should do. It's high time for Christians to listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say to the churches. And this is where you learn what the Holy Spirit has to say to the churches. You don't need a church growth program. You don't need the latest best-selling book. You need the Bible. Amen? Listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. And here's the final promise. We're going to end with this. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, the tree of life, I'm not going to take time to go there because I know we're getting toward the end. But in Genesis chapter 3, 23 and 24, you will read where God took Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden and he blocked the way to the tree of life with a flaming sword and cherubim, mighty angels and a flaming sword, blocked the way to the tree of life. And God said, no more can you eat from the tree of life. Why? Because you've ruined life as we know it. The relationship with God was broken. And I say to people, it was a mercy that God threw them out of Eden and blocked the way to the tree of life. Because how many of you would want to live eternally in your broken body, your broken mind, in this broken world? Anybody up for it? Eternity like this? No thank you. So God blocked the way to the tree of life. He said, you're going to have to look down the road to another tree, the cross of Calvary, to get you out of this mess. Hallelujah. So we get saved by the blood of Jesus, and then we see that the tree of life reappears. And I want you to turn there. Go to Revelation chapter 22. Here's what Jesus was promising. Revelation 22, 1 to 3. You know, a lot of people wonder what happened to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Well, God, you know, he blocked the way, and then I believe he took it. He took it up to heaven. And then in Revelation 22, here's what happens. When we get to heaven... John said, the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal. And it was flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the new Jerusalem. Hallelujah. And also on either side of that river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed. Amen? The curse of sin blocked us from the tree of life. Jesus paid for that and became the curse for our sin. When we trust in him and believe in him, one of the things that will happen when we get to heaven is we will see and eat from the tree of life again. Amen? And it will bring healing to all the nations. And nothing, no body, no mind, no nation, no person, no relationship, nothing again will ever be cursed by sin. Hallelujah. That's the promise that Jesus gives. He says, repent, go back to the love you had at first because to the one who conquers, I will grant you to be able to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Remember when Jesus died on the cross? He said to the thief next to him, today you will be with me where? In paradise. Hallelujah. The tree of life we shall see again. And Jesus said it's to the one who conquers. And you may be sitting there asking yourself, Shelly, how can I conquer? I don't feel like a conqueror. I feel like I'm underneath right now. i got a promise for you. 1 John 5, 4 and 5. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The world's a mess right now. And you feel downtrodden because of it. 
And you think, what hope could there possibly be for this nation? What hope could there possibly be for this world? What hope could there possibly be for us? And I'm here to tell you something. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you have placed your faith in the Jesus Christ of this Bible, you are, amen, an overcomer. You have conquered the world through Jesus Christ. You, this promise can be applied to you that you will eat again of the tree of life and that you will conquer. Look at this. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. But go back and remember what Jesus said. If you do not repent, if you do not go back and do what you did at first, if you do not go back to the love that you had at first, I will remove your lampstand, your influence. You know what John Phillips said about that? He said it is tragically possible to have a saved soul and a lost life. I've preached many sermons on the judgment seat of Christ, and I can't do that right now, but I want to look into this camera and tell you something. It is possible to be saved by the skin of your teeth, but to have totally lost your life and your influence. It is possible to be saved and make it to heaven and find that you've had no influence of any proper kind on anyone and you have nothing to offer Jesus when you get to heaven. Because it was all wrongly motivated. It's possible to have a saved soul in a lost life. But, I'm telling you, when your motivation is your love for Jesus Christ, your life will be so influential your lampstand will burn. Your light will shine. And that's what we need to pray for in the dark times in which we live. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray for each and every one of you that want to be restored to that place just like me. want to remind you that you can get in contact with Hope and Passion. We need your financial giving. If you want me to keep preaching on Sunday mornings and Tuesdays and doing what I'm doing... Help and support us. That's how God gives and supports this ministry is through you. So pray about that. But I want to pray with each and every one of you who wants to go back. Go back to the love that you had at first. And maybe some of you have never had that. Maybe you're a person who's never been really right with the Lord, really on fire for Jesus. You've only played around with religion. Jesus can save you today. It's simple. It's a deep work of the heart, and only God can do it. But it's simple for you to respond. So, Lord, I pray right now for each person that is listening, for the one, Lord, who has never called upon you as Savior, let them reach out to you today and throw up their hands and say, Jesus, take my sin. Jesus, take my life. Jesus, save me. And Lord, I know you'll do it. And for all of those who, like me, want to say to you, Dear Jesus, take me back to the love I had at first. Lord, please touch us. Please give us a true heart of repentance that is in response to the love that you have for us. Do not remove our lampstand, but make our life completely meaningful that it might glorify Jesus Christ in all ways. We thank you in his name. Amen. Thank you so much for your patience and staying tuned into this. I believe this has been a life-changing message by God's Spirit. You are welcome to join us next Sunday morning, 10 a.m., same place, for part four in the Revelation live stream series. God bless you and have a blessed Christmas.